Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the American Naturalist Society and especially the Young Investigator Committee, Becca, Luke, and Jeremy for this really amazing special honor. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity, especially to speak in a symposium alongside Anna, Martha, and Allison. Um, can't wait to hear more about their really inspiring work. The division of natural habitat and ecosystems into smaller and more isolated fragments is a relatively recent global phenomenon caused primarily by human activities and climate change. So this image is of citrus groves outside the town where I grew up uh, in central Florida, a state that we know epitomizes this phenomenon of fragmentation and reduction of natural habitats. Consequences of this for organisms restricted to these small habitat fragments can be really devastating. So as an example from a species I'm working on, Florida scrub jays are a federally endangered species. These are these extreme habitat specialists restricted to early successional fire maintained oak scrub habitat. Over the past century, this Florida scrub habitat has been reduced to less than 10% of its historical range due to this land conversion and fire suppression. And this has had really dramatic, caused really dramatic statewide declines in Florida scrub jay populations, including many documented population extinctions shown here by the red dots. So the decline of Florida scrub jays highlights a well-known problem for conservation, namely small and isolated populations are more likely to go, to go extinct than large and connected ones. Small populations have also long fascinated evolutionary biologists by providing an often replicated opportunity to study interactions among multiple evolutionary forces. So for exa example, in, in small populations that experience greater genetic drift, a deleterious mutation is much more likely to become randomly fixed than in large populations where selection is more efficient. Small populations where most or all mates are relatively closely related also provide opportunities to study inbreeding dynamics and inbreeding depression caused by those deleterious alleles that have drifted to really high frequency. The focus of my talk today is on understanding the complex role of gene flow into small populations. So gene flow is this notoriously challenging, but I think really essential process to understand because it can cause wide ranging effects on adaptation and fitness. The classic view of gene flow is if populations are distributed along an environmental gradient, and gene flow occurs from one environment to another, the introduction of maladaptive alleles will prevent independent evolution of populations in these different environments and act as this homogenizing constraint on adaptive divergence. There's a large body of empirical evidence that supports this view where populations in different environments that experience higher rates of gene flow show reduced phenotypic divergence than more isolated populations. But the majority of these studies deal with relatively large populations that are more or less stable and have been for a long time, so they're more or less in these equilibrium conditions. And on the other hand, gene flow into these small isolated populations and highly drifted populations presents a really different scenario than um, what I just described. So now gene flow provides this really important demographic d benefit of dispersal. Infused variation can counteract inbreeding depression and provide more variation for selection to play a larger role in those populations. And ultimately, gene flow into small populations can actually prevent or delay extinction. The context in which I study gene flow into small, isolated populations is within this framework of genetic rescue. The definition of genetic rescue that I like and that I use is an increase in population growth owing to this immigration of new alleles by more than just the demographic contribution of immigrants, so more than just the numerical contribution of immigrant individuals. 
There are a small handful of examples of successful genetic rescue, mainly coming from the conservation literature. However, these assisted migration type strategies are not widely used in management, despite the fact that there's ubiquitous and overwhelming evidence for inbreeding depression in small and especially in recently fragmented populations. And I think this is largely due to this uncertainty in predicting fit fitness effects of gene flow and in this lack of understanding when the benefits of gene flow will outweigh the more sort of classic homogenizing effects that can reduce fitness. So there's this large gray area of an uncertainty here. I think studying genetic rescue in an experimental context can provide a really powerful framework for understanding what underlies these positive and negative effects of gene flow on fitness. So this framework first requires a manipulation of gene flow and test the effects of that gene flow on genomic and phenotypic variation, and ultimately how these changes can contribute to individual and population fitness. So there's a lot of attention and some really nice examples of study, studies focusing on the genotype-phenotype fitness links, but I think what's unique about this framework is that it involves an experimental manipulation of gene flow and directly tests the effects of that gene flow on adaptation and fitness. More broadly, it contributes to this rapidly developing field of ecoevolutionary dynamics um, by directly linking a manipulation of evolutionary processes to demography, and hopefully also can provide an improved understanding for how to design and implement these assisted migration type strategies for reversing declines of small and threatened populations. So to best tackle this framework, a system is needed in which it's possible to actually manipulate gene flow, to quantify these effects of gene flow on traits and fitness over multiple generations, ideally in the wild. And it's also would be nice to have a reference genome so that we can sort of me mechanistically understand how these dynamics are playing out through the organism's genome. So the work I'll tell you about today took place on the island of Trinidad, which has become known as this natural laboratory for studying the rapid adaptation of guppies and their influence on the ecology and uh, environment of freshwater streams. So the streams that drain the Northern Range Mountains in Trinidad form these independent replicated drainages where guppies have been found to evolve in remarkably similar ways to variation in things like resource availability and the level of predation they experience. So for example, if we zoom into one of these drainages, this is the Guanapo drainage, where the pasivorous fish community varies from a much more diverse and high predation assemblage in the large lowland streams to a much more simple low predation community in the headwaters. And depending on this variation in the predatory fish community, Guppies have evolved mostly parallel differences in many different traits. So for example, these are males from a low predation environment that have evolved more color, larger body size, compared to males from a high predation site. And this parallel divergence is true for many different traits and is mostly predictable throughout streams uh, throughout the island. But the other feature of the system that makes it great and amenable for the questions that I'm interested in is the fact that many of these low predation populations occupy small headwater tributaries. They've often been founded by just one or a few guppies that happen to make it above a waterfall barrier, and so they have really, tend to have really low levels of genetic variation. They're isolated from gene flow, and I think they make good proxies for small fragmented populations. So the story I'll talk about today centers on two of these small native headwater populations which are found in the low predation environment, so they're presumably lap adapted, locally adapted to this environment, um, and they're represented here by these purple circles. It happens that these two focal sites happen to be on the really extreme end of low levels of genetic variation, so data from 10 microsatellites show much lower levels of heterozygosity within these two focal populations um, compared to other low predation headwater sites throughout the island. In 2009, guppies from a downstream high predation 
environment provided the source for this set of introduction experiments conducted by David Resnick and Joe Travis and their colleagues. Um, and so these introductions occurred upstream of the two native focal populations in my study. And these introductions are themselves a really incredible ongoing long-term project to understand the eco-evo dynamics and rapid adaptation of guppies in a new environment. They also set up this really nice opportunity for us to test the effects of new gene flow from a divergent source population into these native focal populations. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my primary collaborators on this work, Chris Funk, Lisa Angeloni, uh, Dale Broder, and John Cronenberger. It's been a really fantastic team to be a part of. So going back to this framework, the introductions resulted in a manipulation of gene flow given that we expect this unidirectional downstream dispersal and migration from these newly established populations into the um, upstream most extent of the native guppies, which were where my focal populations were. And we expected this new gene flow to cause an increase in genetic diversity and a homogenization of genomic variation among populations, and likely a corresponding homogenization of phenotypic traits, at least based on these classic homogenizing view of gene flow. And ultimately, this could produce net positive or negative effects on fitness, depending on whether gene flow into these populations caused a breakdown of local adaptation or more of a genetic rescue effect. So to test the effects of gene flow on genomic and phenotypic variation, I collected these snapshot samples of guppies prior to the introduction experiments, and then about 10 guppy generations or two and a half years after gene flow began. So we have these two time points before and after gene flow. I used RADSeq data aligned to the recently published guppy genome to look at changes in patterns of genome-wide diversity. Uh, so this is nucleotide diversity across a single linkage group uh, in the two focal populations before gene flow in purple compared to the much more genetically diverse source site. Um, and similar patterns as this were found across all 23 linkage groups. So I'm just showing you results from one. At the second time point after gene flow, the same exact population sampled 10 generations after the onset of gene flow, now shown in light blue here. They've experienced this obvious genome-wide increase in the level of nucleotide diversity. This increase in genomic diversity is also reflected by changes in effective population sizes, where those that Taylor and Kaiwal populations before gene flow had extremely small effective population sizes of 16 and 7, compared to the post gene flow estimates of over 1,800 in the Kaiwal and almost 300 in the Taylor. In terms of overall genomic divergence among populations. This is a multivariate PCA plot based on over 12,000 SNP loci and illustrates that before gene flow, this Taylor and Kaiwal populations are divergent from each other, which is what we expected if these are extremely highly drifted small populations and also divergent from that source site. Um, this di high divergence is also reflected in really high average pairwise FST values across the genome between what I'm showing you here is the pre-gene flow Kaiwal population and the source population. Um, so really high average um, divergence between these two populations before gene flow. After gene flow, you can see that focal populations in this uh, PCA plot are now almost indistinguishable from each other and from that source site. And average FST values have um, reduced now close to zero, indicating genome-wide homogenization at most the majority of loci. Okay, so as expected, this new gene flow caused an increase in genomic diversity and a homogenation of variation among these populations. To test how gene flow caused genetically based changes in phenotypic traits, I quantified a set of traits on individuals sampled from those snapshot populations. Uh, before and after gene flow, and then raised for two generations in a common garden environment. So changes between traits in those two time points could be considered genetically based evolution caused by gene flow, given that the envi lab environments and um, wild environments had not changed except for this uh, influx of new alleles. <laughs> 
So in general, we found that gene flow caused phenotypic evolution in the majority of traits, but not necessarily in the direction we'd expect. Um, if we look at this type of multivariate plot based on a set of female life history traits now, you can see that the post-gene flow populations in light blue um, are now much more overlapping than they were before gene flow and yet still distinct from the source population. Uh, so just to recap, gene flow from the source population into the two purple populations um, contributed to this increased divergence between high and low predation populations. Univariate traits responses were somewhat hard to interpret because they didn't necessarily change consistently by trait or population, but we did find this consistent and uh, somewhat surprising pattern for male color traits. So if we think back to the guppy paradigm, it predicts that more colorful males tend to be favored in the low predation environments and more inconspicuous males are favored in sites with higher predation. This is actually the reverse of what we found in our focal sites where these pre-gene flow um, males had lower coloration than the high predation source site. These are uh, color traits measured from standardized photographs on the day that they reach sexual maturity. And I'm just showing proportion of orange here, but this was true for all color metrics that we looked at. And then post-gene flow populations in light blue have evolved more color. So in a sense, this was a homogenization of traits following gene flow, but it's in this direction that we expect to be adaptive. So despite overall genome, genomic homo homogenization, we found that gene flow from this divergent source mostly did not homogenize traits, and in fact often increased genetically based divergence between populations in these different environments, as in what we saw with the female life history traits. And male color traits that were consistently homogenized actually evolved in the predicted adaptive direction. So we can conclude here that gene flow has caused genomic homogenization without the loss of locally adapted phenotypes. And I think that one exciting aspect of this framework is that we can actually explore these genotype phenotype linkages that we're all interested in um, while also specifically addressing a fundamental question about how adaptive divergence is maintained in the face of high homogenizing gene flow. So for example, we can start to identify loci that have remained divergent despite this genome-wide homogenization. So whereas average genome-wide FST values after gene flow was close to zero, a subset of loci retain the, these high levels of divergence and these kind of become candidate loci for regions that are potentially um, maintaining locally important traits. And we can also take advantage of the fact that we had these two streams in really similar environments to look for loci that remain divergent in both of those sites as further evidence of important loci um, underlying locally, lo locally selected traits. And so in our data set, there were 42 of these overlapping SNPs that retained high divergence, and the majority of these SNPs map to coding regions of the genome, so suggestive of some sort of fun functional significance. With finer temporal sampling, it will also be possible to identify introduced sort of high fitness alleles that are swept to fixation or to high frequency faster than background rates of introgression. So for example, introduced alleles that may underlie these color pattern variation may have been really strongly selected for in that low predation environment and rapidly swept to high frequency. And this is a future direction we're excited about pursuing. But the final and what I think is the most exciting question is how does this gene flow affect changes in individual fitness and demography? To test the effects of gene flow on population dynamics and fitness, I conducted a large-scale mark recapture and genetic monitoring study, censusing those Taylor and Kaiwal focal sites for 29 consecutive months, three of which were before the onset of gene flow. So in total, I monitored close to 10,000 individual guppies, which clearly would have been entirely impossible without the help of some incredible field assistants throughout the course of this study. And what's really fun at meetings like this is that many of these people are outstanding evolutionary biologists and the names in red here are people that I've seen at this very meeting and they're all doing really inspiring work. <laughs>
So to paint the scene of this guppy mark recapture, the idea is we go out to a given reach of stream that we're monitoring, so about 100 meters of stream, and the goal is to sample every single guppy that's over a certain size class, so over 14 millimeters or the width of your thumb, from that given stream reach, bottle the guppies in algae and take them up to the fish lab. They get put in tanks based on where they're found on the stream. All fish each month are photographed and weighed. All new recruits to the population get a unique elastomer tattoo uh, under a microscope and then also have uh, scales sampled for genetics. And then the next day we rebottle those guppies, re return them to the exact pool where they were captured a few days earlier. So because our capture probabilities were so high, we can use this number of captures per month as fairly accurate estimate of overall population size. These populations started out under 100 individuals in both streams before the introductions took place. After the first year, population sizes had nearly tripled in size. And by the end of the study, both populations were about 10 times as large. You can definitely see some fluctuations that we expect based on seasonality in Trinidad, but for example, you can see these increases in each successive wet season, which is when we know guppy populations everywhere throughout Trinidad are at their lowest. So it's really been this sustained increase in population size following gene flow. To understand what individuals caused these increases in population size, I concentrated on the first four generations following the onset of gene flow and genotyped every individual in both focal sites at 12 microsatellite markers. So this was just around 3,000 guppies. And using these highly po po polymorphic microsats, I, I was able to reconstruct wild pedigrees for the two populations and actually get estimates for total lifetime reproductive success for these individuals that were caught and genotyped in the first 17 months of the study. Um, so in this spider web looking thing, uh, each level is a generation. Blue lines connect male guppies to their offspring and red lines connect mothers to theirs. So for example, this pedigree assigned four recruits to this male, so he had a lifetime reproductive success of four. Individual fitness estimates ranged from zero to 53, so the rock star guppy had 53 offspring assigned to him. Um, and we see this commonly found really highly skewed distribution where most individuals have zero or very low fitness estimates. This plot is with all fish in the pedigree and this is showing individuals that had lifetime reproductive success of at least one to better show that distribution. Using the microsatellites, I also assigned every individual uh, continuous hybrid index between zero, which reflects a pure native genotype, and one, which is the pure immigrant genotype. So what I'll show here is the relationship between an individual's hybrid index and its total lifetime reproductive success. And what I found was that in general, the more immigrant-like genotypes had higher fitness, but interesting, all these rock star individuals with these extreme high fitness estimates were some level of hybrid. And remember, this pedigree and fitness estimate uh, data are based on the first four generations after gene flow, but those snapshot samples uh, for which we have the genomic data was uh, taken after 10 generations at the end of the study. And if we look at average genome-wide hybrid indices at that point, at the end of the study, they correspond almost exactly to this range of hybrid indices that produce the individuals that had the highest fitness. So it suggests that these individuals continued to do well and contribute disproportionately to the increases in population size. So given these large increases in population size that could be attributed largely to high hybrid fitness, we concluded that gene flow caused genetic rescue in both of these recipient populations where the increase in population growth due to the infusion of this new genetic variation was beyond the demographic addition of immigrant individuals. And this occurred despite the fact that immigration was from an adaptively divergent source population 
and it did not cause the loss of locally adaptive traits, despite overall genomic homogenization. In fact, gene flow actually facilitated genetically based evolution of some traits like male color in the adaptive direction, so it facilitated adaptation in this case. And sort of stepping back, this is a direction that I'm really excited about pursuing, namely exploring the extent of the fitness benefits of gene flow beyond just this recovery from inbreeding depression, which is how genetic rescue is often sort of talked about or written about in the literature. Um, so I recently tested thermal tolerance in these rescued Taylor and Kaiwal populations and compared them to similar neighboring headwater sites that haven't had that recent gene flow and found that the genetically rescued populations showed the highest levels of thermal tolerance even though stream temperatures were exactly the same across all these sites. And actually as we speak, my lab is setting up cattle tank experiments to test whether populations that have experienced recent gene flow show faster evolutionary responses when exposed to novel environments. In general, I think what we're gaining by using this experimental gene flow manipulation framework in guppies and in other experimental systems is not only a better mechanistic understanding of how gene flow can directly affect phenotypes, adaptation, and fitness, but it also contributes to this increase in consensus that genetic rescue is a really plausible outcome, possibly under a wider set of conditions than um, we've previously assumed. And it's a strategy that's perhaps been underutilized due to concerns over these more classic views of maladaptive homogenizing effects of gene flow. So I was extremely moved by Kathleen's really beautifully articulated message in her talk on Saturday evening. This idea that many of the foundational theories in our field are based on assumptions of rare events and endless time. And that these assumptions are clearly not matched to the level of disturbance and the rates of change on our planet today. So what I hope to accomplish through this work and my work in the future is to use an improved understanding of how to manipulate contemporary interactions between gene flow, drift, and selection so that we may be able to buy time for threatened populations and even facilitate adaptation under rapid global change. I'd like to thank ASN again, uh, my collaborators, funding sources, and other folks who've contributed a lot to making this possible. Um, I'd like to remember Jasper Lotzes Hills, for whom this award is named. And also just want to note that I uh, started my lab this year at Kellogg Biological Station uh, in Michigan, and I'm looking for graduate students and postdocs, so please spread the word. Thank you very much. <laughs>